Well, welcome everyone to the San Diego ULT Aquarian Series. And this is an ongoing series on of uh, talks and presentations based on the Aquarian Almanac. And each week there are these um, luminescent themes that uh, appear. And most of them are connected with times of the year, for example, uh, different celebrations and festivities, pilgrimages, holidays. And um, last week was the vow of enlightenment. And we heard that was a pretty remarkable presentation. And um, that was based on Buddha Purnima, for example. And it's they, there's another aspect to these Aquarian Almanac themes, which is the continuity and the thread, the Sutratma of continuity that goes from one to another. And this week we have the noble path, which naturally would come out of the vow of enlightenment, right? Um, and um, so Laura Gray will be presenting today. And she has this quote that says, do not follow me, but follow the path I show. The masters are behind from HPB. And look at this beautiful slide. Wow. Um, and then uh, next week, uh, we will be hearing um, Martin Leiterman present on the Divine Pymander of Hermes Trismegistus. And then after that, uh, we will be uh, having a meeting on thought, will, feeling, and health. And this has to do with the relationship of ideation to health, human ideation and, and health. And then um, we're going to try and put together a panel of myself interviewing and two um, theosophists who are actually health practitioners. And um, they've got some books that they've been reading and, and tied in with theosophy and so forth. So we'll try and do like a panel interview kind of a presentation then. Then we will be hearing about, you know, not unrelated, the Aquarian therapy. And in my mind, Aquarian and theosophical are kind of interchangeable words. Um, and this has to do with maybe new modalities and so forth. Right. Following that will be ULT day, which is totally related to uh, Aquarian therapy. And um, it goes on like that. And then related to that, the theme after that will be Songkapa. So that's very much connected to this entire um, philosophical movement, you could say. So Laura Gray is our presenter. She's a longtime student. Most of all of you guys know her and we're very much forward to hearing the noble path. Okay, Laura, it's all yours. Well, thank you for this opportunity to contemplate this, this noble path, the path that we're all following. We're fellow travelers and um, we've all come from different directions today, but here we are at one meeting. And as we know um, that this journey began not with this meeting, but began in our distant lives. All the choices that we have made up to this point brings us together on this path, on this journey. The first thing a hiker looks for on an unknown terrain is a path, a way made clear a place that winds between the trees and the rocks and that has a traversable slope and markers along the way to prevent getting lost. The other nice thing is that no matter what condition you're in, there is always a path that you can follow and to enjoy the nature and the trees. You can take an uphill rock climb to the great vistas that we have here in the north or a wide graveled path that allows one to feel nature without much difficulty. We have our human family that creates a path for us when we enter incarnation. Parents, teachers, mentors make a condition for us to grow in, to learn. And at the beginning of our evolutionary journey, the lunar petries from the karmic tendencies of past cycles of existence created the forms that we are using today. And with those conditions, we create the forms of tomorrow. 
The conditions provided are an opportunity for us to apply the higher principles and evolve better forms for ourselves and others. We are always on a path created by others and we are creating a path. The elder brothers who have experienced what we are going through now, they go beyond the personal to the eternal, seeing more of the path ahead than we can see. They give indications and ideas that we can make our own as we gain experience. To understand all this, the secret doctrine gives three fundamental ideas. That of the one life expressing itself through a law that can be known. It is no longer a mystery of God or a random manifestation. This one life moves through space and time according to law. Through analogy and correspondence, we can see these three fundamentals all around us through cycles, cause and effect, and the changing forms or reincarnation. The elder brothers or masters of wisdom make visible the potential of all humanity and nature. They make visible the noble path. In the key to theosophy, HPB reminds us that all real change begins in the invisible side of nature and man. What we see reflected in our current human conditions is in effect a result of an invisible path taken by the one life through form in a process of becoming. First, by natural impulse, according to cyclic law, and then, in the case of men and women, by our own self-effort. People are always talking about originality, but what do they mean? As soon as we are born, the world begins to work upon us. And this goes on to the end. And after all, what can we call our own except energy, strength, and will? If I could give an account of all that I owe to great predecessors and contemporaries, there would be but a small balance in my favor. Goethe. Our knowledge is the amassed thought and experience of innumerable minds. Our language, our science, our religion, our opinions, our fancies, we inherited. Our country, customs, laws, our ambitions, and our notions of the fit and the fair, all these we never made. We found them ready-made. We but quote them. Emerson. And from our beloved teacher, she tells us in the introductory to the secret doctrine, I may repeat what I have stated all along and which I now clothe in the words of Montaigne. I have here made only a nosegay of culled flowers and have brought nothing of my own but the string that ties them. Mr. Wadia, in his talk on originality and quotation, asks, how do thoughts and images emerge in our own consciousness? What we come to know is but a reflection of what was considered before. So what does it mean to make these ideas our own? How do we follow this path that is uniquely ours, but yet well-traveled by others? On this path of evolution, there are always those behind us in awareness and those ahead of us. And it is important to keep in mind that they are all here now. As we walk the path, inwardly and outwardly, all is recorded in the Akasha, the divine astral. The great ideas, the noble truths are immortal 
and a long line of sages and seers have been the mediators between the divine archetypal ideas and the human creators who use their wisdom light. On this path, a feeling of non-separateness, of universal brotherhood, sisterhood, is an essential compass. And without it, we are surely to get lost and fail to find our way. We are also advised that we should study first the laws governing man and the universe, just as we study the maps provided before we set out on our hike. We ask others if they noticed any dangers or pitfalls on the path through the woods, and so too on the path of discipline and Raj Yoga. The teachers through the ages give us indications of the dangers. In the light on the path, before we even begin to cross the threshold of the portals, we must be able to endure all the shocks and despair of keenest enjoyment and pain without loss of equilibrium before the sen astral senses can be opened. This is a merciful law. And if we break those laws, we can lose our physical health and on the inner plane, our psychic health. The disciple is compelled to become his own master before he adventures on this perilous path and attempt to face those beings who live and work in the astral realm. The astral plane can delude us. We can lose our way within it. So we adv are advised to join first the mind and the heart to look to the elder brothers who have traveled this way before us as, and are here today as living men, thinkers, and who aid in the evolution of humanity and nature. In regards to um, this evolution, this journey, Mr. Judge in his articles gives three great ideas the first idea is that there is a great cause, the cause of sublime perfection and human brotherhood, sisterhood. This rests upon the essential unity of the whole human family and is a possibility because sublime perfection and actual realization of brotherhood, sisterhood on every plane of being are one and the same thing. The second idea is that man as a being may be raised up to perfection. That in fact, we as the self are perfect, but we must raise up our sevenfold matter to express the self, to sacrifice the personal to the impersonal, to be perfect even as the father in heaven is perfect, to act for and as the self of all that lives. And the third idea is the illustration of the first two. It's the proof of our evolutionary potential. It is the masters of wisdom, the elder brothers who have traveled this path before us. These three together are important to contemplate they exemplify the purpose of being human. We have the material needed through karma to begin on this path. So working with the conditions, working with the weather that we find ourselves in and with the tools that we have, we can begin the journey. Knowing of unity, law and being, and having reached self-consciousness, we must now travel this path through our own efforts. The masters but point the way. We must make a decision in this regard. All travel on the path begins with a decision, an act of will. 
Do we continue on the path of our personal material existence? Or do we take hold of our personality, the matter that we use, and use it to express spirit? This decision is exemplified in scriptures as a seeking refuge, a going within and less reliance on external temporary nature. Seek refuge to the Buddha and the Dhamma or words, teachings, the teachings. It is interesting when we look at the word Dhammapada. It is, is made up of two words, Dhamma, which means teaching, and Pada, which means foot. It is the path indicated by the teachings of Buddha. It is the path that Buddha traveled. He indicated the four noble truths of sorrow, the cause of sorrow, transcending of sorrow, and the noble eightfold path, which leads to the cessation of sorrow. And this is the path that we take towards the area path or the path of adeptship. In the Bible, Matthew 6, it says, no one can serve two masters. And the Dhammapada says, if by giving up a lesser happiness, one may behold a greater one. Let the wise man give up the lesser happiness in consideration of the greater. And from the voice of the silence, personal will must give way to divine will. The self of matter and the self of spirit can never meet. To aid us in understanding this journey on the path and how to prepare, we have these books that we see, The Voice of the Silence, The Dhammapada, Patanjali's Yoga Aphorisms, Light on the Path, The Bhagavad Gita, Tao Chi, excuse me, Tao Chi King. And everywhere around the globe, there are theosophical students and others who are studying these books. You can study them in any lodge. Um, there'll be classes taking place online. And so we invite anyone who might be new to Theosophy to join in those classes. And, um, and anyone who wishes to start a class in these devotional books, um, all students at all the lodges are willing to help in that regard. For we're all on the same journey. It is the one journey. The key is to keep the path wide and open, to not have the path end too soon. Sometimes we can climb a ladder only to get to the top and find out that we're on the wrong ladder. And so we have to trace all the lines back to where we went off track. And we might miss further opportunities of awareness. In this aspect, we are, are on our own and we must travel alone. Only we can make sure that we have no mud on our feet, that we have so purified ourselves, that we are prepared as we see the hikers on this path. They're walking together, but each one had to prepare for that journey. We have to purify ourselves of selfishness, of the feeling of separateness. Everyone on that path is watching out for each other and caring for each other and making sure that they stay safe. Any sense of separateness from the others becomes like mud and glues us to the spot on the path and stays further progress until we can work that out. In this regard, we're helping each other, reflecting the karmic lessons needed. The humanity around us cheers us on and acts as goads to us on this journey. HPB lifted the veil just a little of the wisdom religion for humanity. And we lift the veil to a degree for each other through our own efforts to understand this wisdom and apply it to our lives. Let us consider a few aspects of this path from the wings of the great bird. We have a position from which to discern. In the Gita, 
to Arjuna, the warrior, Krishna, the higher self, says the self must be slain along with all his loved ones, friends, and family. This is very difficult to do. But if we are able to self-adjust and self-analyze our own natures, we must also recognize that those around us are more than what we consider our loved ones, friends, and family. They too are eternal pilgrims on a journey of becoming. And when the arrows of thoughts and feeling are flying within us, we must choose the devotion to Krishna, the self of all, and cease to the cling to the forms we love. Arjuna laid down his weapons at this point and said to Krishna, I can't do that. But Krishna waits and he says, you must. We can go no further in our becoming until we recognize that we are all that same one self. The personality is necessary for the manifestation of our work and efforts on this physical plane. It is a mask we must wear and it never expresses all that we are and must be adjusted moment by moment. It takes on a life of its own and this must be brought under sway by our highest intentions, by the self-governing pilgrim. Say it the great law. We'll go back a bit there. I want to read that. Everyone maybe have read it, but let's reflect on it. In order to become the knower of all self, thou first of self to be the knower. To reach the knowledge of that self, thou hast to give up self to non-self, being to non-being, and then thou canst repose between the wings of the great bird. I, sweet as rest between the wings of that which is not born nor dies, but is the alm throughout eternal ages. Thank you. When we cease to hear the many, we can discern the one. We can discern the real from the unreal. Over many lifetimes, we have acted and planted thoughts and feelings, and cyclic law will bring them all, will, will bring back all those energies that we manifested. We must experience these, but we need not get entangled in them. Taking hold of our true nature, learning from our past, and acting for and as the self of all beings, we as one humanity can undo the errors of the past together. This earth plane is but a dismal entrance leading to a light that can never be extinguished. So as Mr. Judge says, kick not at karma, our own ever comes back to us, how we receive it determines the journey ahead. As we experience the pairs of opposites that are necessary to this temporary life, we must act from a position of devotion. We must not live as personalities, but through personality or condition. To use our current instrument, our sevenfold nature, in such a way that we are of benefit to all that lives. This must not be done in regard to self gain, though, but from a place of the heart, of love and mortal. Any taint of selfishness and nature will find it out and make it visible for us, and we will have to slay that lower tendency before we can continue towards the path. This we can do if we are between the wings, undisturbed by the lower tendency. We use its energy in the opposite direction of service and intention in devotion, intent in devotion. We have hardly touched on all that the voice of the silence has to say in regards to the path. And there is much to weave into our being as we move 
towards that noble path. Here we see in this picture, there are many rocks that we must um, remove from within our own nature. And we are told that we cannot travel on the path before we become the path itself. The term antakarana has different meanings in various traditions. Theosophy defines it in a way not found anywhere else. It is the connecting link, the bridge or path between our personal ego, the lower mind, and the higher ego, the divine mind. Above and beyond this is our higher self. To find that, we can consider some quotes from the, the voice of the silence. Let thy soul lend its ear to every cry of pain, as like the lotus bears its heart to drink the morning sun. Let not the fierce sun dry one tear of pain before thou hast wiped it from the sufferer's eye. But let each burning human teardrop on thy heart and there remain, nor ever brush it off until the pain that caused it is removed. These tears, O thou of heart most merciful, these are the streams that irrigate the fields of charity immortal. Tis such on such soil that grows the midnight blossom of Buddha, more difficult to find more rare to view than the flower of the Vulgate tree. It is the seed of freedom from rebirth. It isolates, isolates the air hat, both from strife and lust. It leads him through the fields of being unto the peace and bliss known only in the land of silence and non-being. To make pure the Atakarana, Lower Manus must move towards higher Manus. It is the battlefield which disappears when the struggle ends. Once the two become one, as stated in the voice of the silence, to sacrifice self personal to self impersonal, the path or bridge is then destroyed. One wonders at this time if it is then that the noble path begins, the path to be a Nirmanakaya. This is the path of Raj, Raj Yoga and is defined by the development of cities, sort of kind of like removing the rocks, the obstacles, to develop the higher psychic and spiritual powers through our efforts to be of service to others. It is the union with the higher self or the self of all. It is the discipline exemplified in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's a preparation for still further tasks ahead. This preparation is of the mind. Before we walk that path, we must learn the laws and the theory. In other words, again, it is preparing ourselves for this journey, for it seems that one path leads to another like a spiral. One path takes us around an upward curve. We become more aware of the real and feel ourselves starting all over again. At the moments of enlightenment we experience, these are but preparation. And we are not to look for their results, but we can know that when the cycles permit, as in nature, all those moments of enlightenment will bloom or manifest. Robert Crosby stated, we will become constitutionally incapable of a selfish act. And it is at that time that we are prepared to enter the higher path, which climbs still further. Fragment two of the voice of the silence speaks of the two paths, a path of final liberation and a path of service to all that lives. The one leads to nirvana, 
takes out, out of all earthly awareness. And the other is a path of service, of a renunciation of that nirvanic bliss. When the time comes that we are prepared to enter the noble path, we must choose. Can we consider too that each day we are building that final choice? Each path creates a different robe or vehicle and every task to help others requires us to have a form. To sum up Raja Yoga is like putting the contents of a barrel into a thimble. But these four ideas can help us in that regard. One is purification detachment from objects of sense and desire, moving from attachment to personality to a universal position. Two, the senses and organs are controlled in a way that they serve the self of all, that we shine through them, but take nothing from them. Three, duty, the royal talisman, the right performance of action, is the shining of the paramitas, the virtues, through every thought, word, and act, and for complete devotion to Krishna, the higher self, the self of all. Here we see before us the fragment three um, from the voice of the silence, these um, seven paramitas. And Mr. Wadia was a great help for us students trying to understand these paramitas and putting them into practice. He indicates that the first three, Dana, Sheila, and Kashanti, form a triad of love, harmony, and patience. And that's five, six, and seven of Virya, Diana, and Prashna create a triad as well. Um, and that the two, the, the, sorry, the five, six, and seven, that Prajna, Virya, and Diana, is a triad that uh, Mr. Wadia describes as dauntless energy, the further pursuit of contemplation, and full spiritual perception. But between the two is viraga, which is that um, indifference to pleasure and pain, illusion conquered, truth alone perceived. And that middle one is very important. It's like the fulcrum. It's like the balance that makes possible the expression of, of the upper triad of those paramedics, paramedics. And it's interesting too, when we look at what Mr. Wadia says, that Prajna is compassionate, ab the absolute compassion. And, and he says that there are seven states of Prajna corresponding to the seven states of the compassion absolute. So we can see here within that one word, there is much that we need to consider and contemplate. A real yogi, a united one, is of course an altruist. And one cannot in verity exercise divine virtues without a prior living to benefit mankind. So we see here too, that the virtues indicate universal brotherhood. But you can't achieve the virtues without a feeling of universal brotherhood, of that path of universal brotherhood. In the voice of the silence, it also mentions six and 10 in number. And we often puzzle about what that means, but Mr. Wadi again helps us in that regard. And so does the um, diagram on page 200 of the secret doctrine. And he says, the 10 transcendental paramedas include the three corresponding 
to the three planes beyond the seven principles. The high, three higher planes beyond the planetary chain. Man in the earth chain is a seven principle being, but in reality, he has to become a perfect number 10. The three hypostatuses of the first fundamental are the metaphysical aspects of the three higher or transcendental paramitas. The paramitas are human, they're universal, and they're divine. They indicate personal morality, egoic morality, and monadic morality. Consider this therein practical occultism. So we can see that when we look at these seven parameters in the voice of the silence, that they are, they indicate portals. We don't get, HPB doesn't go into the portals that these parameters are the key to. But we can see from the writing of Mr. Wadi an indication of what it means. And that um, as we travel on this path, as we become the path itself, it opens up more vistas um, as evolution has no beginning and no end. So that um, if we're looking for an ending, then we're looking in the wrong way. We have to look at it as an ever, ever process of becoming a path that continues to open up ahead of us. Thank you. <laughs> we have a quote and uh, from the chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, Monica has agreed to read this, the importance of this quote and why we are looking at it today is because it gives us a description of what it means to become the path and how we, we can use it to um, help us to discern and to adjust our natures so that we can continue on this journey together. Thank you, Monica. You'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Sorry. My devotee, who is free from enmity, well disposed towards all creatures, merciful, wholly exempt from pride and selfishness, the same in pain and pleasure, patient of wrongs, contented, constantly devout, self-governed, firm in resolves, and whose mind and heart are fixed on me alone, is dear unto me. He also is my beloved of whom mankind is not afraid and who has no fear of man, who is free from joy, from despondency, and the dread of harm. My devotee who is unexpecting, pure, just, impartial, devoid of fear, and who have forsaken interest in the results of action is dear unto me. He also is worthy of my love, who neither rejoiceth nor findeth fault, who neither lamenteth nor coveteth, and being my servant hath forsaken interest in both good and evil results. He also is my beloved servant who is equal minded to friend or foe, the same in honor and dishonor, in cold and heat, 
in pain and pleasure and is unsolicitous about the event of things. To whom praise and blame are as one who is of little speech, content with whatever cometh to pass, who hath no fixed habitation and whose heart full of devotion is firmly fixed. But those who seek this sacred ambrosia, the religion of immortality, even as I have explained it, full of faith, intent on me above all others, and united to devotion, are my most beloved. Thus in the Upanishads called the Holy Bhagavad Gita, in the science of the Supreme Spirit, in the book of devotion, in the colloquy between the Holy Krishna and Arjuna, stands the 12th chapter by name, devotion by means of faith, bhakti yoga. Thank you, Monica, thank you very much. From the book of images, Rajan Gargya. The disciples constantly at each step that they took, there sprung up before each man of the multitude, two paths, one broad and full and fair, seeming, pointing straight ahead in the line of their desire. The other, mounting, steep and abrupt, seemed to end or be swallowed in darkness. Few gave even one glance at the steep path. Most entered at once the fair way, which seemed straight, but which turned to the left. Master, teach me the meaning of this symbol. Why do all choose the smooth road and none try the rugged path? Dreams are born of the desires which are hid in the heart. All seek to enter the path, but they follow the voice of desire which is golden and sweet and enticing, luring men on. The path is the service of soul. When men aspire to enter the path, desire dreams an easy path. Why do not the masters and the gurus restrain them and show them the path of duty? It is the master in the heart of each which offers at each step that men, women take the steep path you have seen. Cannot men see the true path? They see, but they do not consider because of the desires hidden in the heart. Why do not the masters speak showing the true path? In their dreams, desire, clothed in the light of their souls, seems to them the master. And the voice of the guru seems but a dream, hard and unfeeling. Can nothing be done to awaken these souls wrapped in the images of desire? In their dreams, they always they choose always the road that seems fair and smooth, but the myriad desires bruise their feet. Then they consider and listen. Ah, said Emery, even as I was bruised and came to thee, my preceptor in the beginning. I was with you always, answered the guru, for whatever the path taken by mankind that path is mine. So now we can open up for comments and questions and more ideas. Do you want me to unshare, stop the share? Yes. And, okay. Yeah, that's great. Wow, thank you so much for that. Uh, you've got an eager beaver there. You got a hand up already. Oh, good. Judy. 
Well, everybody, everybody will have to unmute. Sorry about that. A uh, wonderful presentation. Laura, thank you. I just wondered about that very first famous quotation from HPB where she says, follow not me or my path, but uh, follow your own path and, and the masters who are behind. Now, I always thought of the masters in a sense as being the ones who went ahead of us. But, and what the, this says in a sense, as you said at the end, that the masters somehow are always behind or within us. And mm -hmm. that uh, is what we have to follow. We have to be ultimately our own guide. So do you think that is correct? Yeah, when we, when we consider that, that um, I often think of the, uh, when we had 21, my children turned 21 and we'd have a big party. Mm. And um, we would always, I would always say to them that, okay, up until this point in time, I've been ahead of you. I've been showing you which way to go and helping you on that journey. You're 21 now, I'm behind you. I'm here if you need me, but now you have to move forward on your own. You have to figure this out for yourself, but I'm here, I'm right behind you. So we think that that might be what it means, that the masters are behind us. We have to travel this path on our own, but they're right there, they're not far away. What do we think? Um, I could mention something. Sure. Um, I'm also thinking that, yeah, I think that's what it is. It's like, because we always say that they're behind, uh, Crosby says the, the, the Mahatmas are always working. They're never not there. Um, so that's kind of something to know that it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like Krishna says, if I were not indefatigable in action, then um, the wheels of the universe wouldn't actually keep going. Um, but also, um, HPB is saying a little bit of, don't follow me personally, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't teachers. And I mean, we view her as a teacher for sure, but she's also pointing beyond herself. So yes, just another. Well, there's a story of um, a man who's in his cottage and he sees Buddha coming down the pathway. And he's so eager to meet him that he runs out his door and he immediately falls into a pit. <laughs> and he can't, there's no way. He spends his many, many lifetimes trying to get out of that pit. But when he finally makes it to the surface, Buddha is there. And he says, ah, you made it. I've been waiting for you. Mm. And so that pit that we fall into seems to be that purification of our sevenfold nature that we have to do. And it seems to be the removing of the rocks mm -hmm. that we saw in that picture. Um, that we have to we have to do that work. But the Buddha is always there. Monica. I, I, thank you so much for this. What a, a, a beautiful presentation, uh, Laura, uh, just beautiful. I'm just reminded um, as we talk about this, um, uh, the elder brothers being behind us and going forward. Um, in the when I first came into theosophy, someone spoke to me about this aloneness we have that you, you, in a certain way, you are most definitely on your own. You are the one that has to do the work to uh, make the connection uh, with the higher self, to do whatever it is that we have to do. But there's two things to remember. We're all alone together, that's one. And this aloneness doesn't necessarily mean dependence on the 
ego. So those two ideas that were sort of put into my head early on uh, gave me a, a little bit of a tightrope, I guess that's the way to put it, to, mm -hmm. to find the balance. Yeah. So it just reminded me of that. Yeah, tightrope is a good analogy. Another one is dancing on the head of a pin. Yeah. It's very uncomfortable, yes. but yet you can turn in all directions, you know? Yes, beautiful. So, any other ideas on this? Um, David, and then Anthony. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking part of uh, HPB statement might have to do with the fact that uh, like three of us might have the same experience or we might read the same uh, aphorism, but we interpret it differently. Mm -hmm. So we, each of us has to, if we're really being true to the search for truth, we each may go down a different road for a while. That's right. And, and, uh, and, and the idea to me is that, that we, we have the support of the teachers that are behind and uh, they know better than we do we'll learn where that road leads us and we'll, we'll backtrack and, and get to the right road or, or you know, we'll, we'll, we'll gain knowledge and growth that way. That's right. So, the other so thing, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, the other thing that seems to come out of that, David, is this idea that how much we have to let go of what we think we know right. in order to embrace more of what's coming. And in preparing any talk, we come up against our own ignorance, our own limitations, we become aware of that. And um, we have to remove those obstacles even further. And it, it's like each time we, we meet upon the read the secret doctrine or we read the voice of the silence, we're starting all over again, kind of in a spiral way, you know? Anthony, did you have a hand up? Yes, I did. Um, I was uh, thinking about uh, what um, Monica had said about um, you know the aloneness, but then yes. I had thought about the um, you know the refuge taking refuge in the three jewels: the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. I believe the last is is most important: the Sangha. Uh, that that sense of a spiritual family um, is uh, is is so important when you're treading a path and when you're beginning a path you know when you're just say you're 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 just say you attempt to climb a mountain right and you have no background no training nothing and you attempt to climb a mountain well the results are probably going to be disastrous so how do you how how this treading a path you had mentioned that it does take some preparation what sort of spiritual preparation do you think it, it, it needs to tread a path? Yes. Well, we think that um, sometimes we wonder that we haven't even started on the path yet. You know, that we are still in the process of preparing. And when you read that chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, of the description of the devotee to Krishna. It seems that we have to become all that before we can even enter the noble path. Sometimes we wonder if it's, if we can't begin until that is, we've accomplished that. And so we see that that process of getting ready is the tuning of our instrument, the tuning of our sevenfold nature. Um, and as was mentioned about, you know, the compassion that we need to have in order to raise up matter. And we have to do it together. We can't do it individually. Even someone who's climbing a mountain has to have a base camp with people there prepared to help with the journey up even higher. So we all, you know, you can't do it alone. And as we saw in the picture of the globe that Jerry so beautifully provided, is that it takes all of us together to raise up matter and to um, 
lift each other up. And we might not achieve any kind of greatness, but we might be able to help someone else along the path. And they in turn might become even greater than ourselves and help others as well. Uh, Shoshoba? Shoba, sorry. Yeah, I had to unmute myself. Thank you, that was beautiful, Laura. I was thinking of the story you talked about uh, during the Q&A, and I was just thinking when the disciple falls in the uh, pit uh, and, and then he finally gets out, the, the words of the, 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 the Buddha of saying, uh, I was waiting for you, indicate so much compassion. So there's so much hope for the person on the path that, you know, if I am ready through all the crazy mistakes I make, but if I keep persisting, there's somebody, there is hope, there is compassion, there is love. And I, I thought that was very beautiful. Thank you. It is beautiful. And there are the elder brothers who are there waiting at the outside of our pit. But the other thing is that the real self, the perceiver that we are, that that part of us that looks directly on ideas, doesn't go into any pit. It doesn't go into any state of consciousness, but awaits outside of it for us. Mm -hmm. And and we can see that in our daily life. You know, we we come out of a state of of consciousness and we go, and we look around and there's the self there's the wisdom it's right there waiting for us and so um it's not only the great teacher ahead of us on the path but it's also our own true self our own higher nature that is always there one of the things i didn't get into on this path is journey that we really need to pay attention to is the journey that we take every 24 hours. Every 24 hours, we go through the waking, the dreaming, and the dreamless. And we see this repetition is necessary for occultism, that we travel through these different states of consciousness and back again until we discover that we are the traveler. We are not the state of consciousness. And then when we be to cover that we are the traveler, then we have to so purify our waking state that we can enter the dreaming and then gain benefit from the dreamless, dreamless sleep and bring back that knowledge and prajna that belongs to us, that is there waiting for us. So Susan. Oh, uh, thank you, Laura, for the very inspiring talk. And, and um, I was thinking in regard to the path, you know, Anthony mentioned that we can't climb a mountain without preparation. But how does one prepare for this? Well, one, one has to travel the lower paths. That's part of the preparation. So I think that that's where we mostly find ourselves. We mostly, in the, in the cycle of, of um, the waking and state, that's, that's where, where we're traveling in preparation, as you've pointed out, for the noble path. We're attempting to, to clear uh, some of the uh, rocks out of the way. And I was also thinking with regard to uh, Monica's comment about being alone. I, Mr. Judge said in one of his letters, work now as if you were alone and always going to be alone. Taking such an attitude will bring out your strength, your reliance being on the law, the lodge, and your inner self. So that seems to be part of the preparatory state that we find ourselves in you know it seems to us we're alone as we know but yes. we of course are traveling with everyone thanks thank you very well said and very helpful on this journey as we saw that 
the group of people uh, traveling on that rocky path, um, each one had to come to that uh, gathering prepared. They couldn't depend on others to prepare them. They had to take responsibility for their own preparation and um, be self-sufficient on that journey. You know, that's an important part. That And oftentimes as students, we, we don't take um, that position. We don't, um, we lean too heavily. We, we sit around too long at somebody else's fire rather than learning how to make our own. And what Susan said is very important. Monica? Yes, I, I had a question um, uh, regarding this preparation. Uh, isn't it true that um, experiencing our karma and reincarnating are the, uh, that's the preparation? Absolutely. You know, everything, we're not to kick at karma. And this is where we all come together in this too. We need to, whenever there's conflict, whenever there's friction, we should see that as an opportunity to prepare for the path rather than seeing it as taking it personally or taking it from the position of the personality. We should see it rather as, oh, this is showing me something. This is helping me, you know, that our enemy is, is our friend. You know, that the, the words that we get from each other cheer us, but we also get kind of poked every once in a while. And that poking is really important. That's part of that journey as well. And we need to learn how to, to read the language of karma as it's happening to us every day, you know, rather than reacting to karma or kicking at it, as Mr. Judge says, read it like a book that's telling us how to travel on the path. David. Oh, I, I, what everyone has said is really meaningful to me, but I know from personal experience also that we can over-prepare ourselves sometimes. And if you, uh, if you won't go, oh, now when I make this quote, <laughs> the journey of a thousand miles, right? Begins yeah. with the first step, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so. We can never hear those um, <laughs> mantras too often. Okay. <laughs> yes. But we have that decision that we have to make, that act of will. And right. as Boati points out, the only thing we bring, the only thing we bring into and to our incarnation is strength, energy, and will, which is very interesting to consider that, you know, and that, that is an important thing about that first step, that decision to take that first step. Mm -hmm. And, and when we do that, that's when we start to discover ourselves. And that's when we begin the path to become the path itself. Any other thoughts or ideas? I have a question. Sure. Um, you referred in your talk um, about the idea that um, I think you said the light of the paramitas can shine through every thought, word, and deed. Something like that. Yes. You can deny that you said that, but if, if you did, um, I was wondering if you could expound upon that. To shine the light of the paramitas in every thought, word, and deed. Well, we know everything begins with a thought. And if the words that are coming out of our mouth or the actions that we are performing are not do not reflect what we read in chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita then we have to go back to our thinking why is that I'm not acting in harmony why is it I'm not feeling charity at this moment in time why is it that I'm not feeling the harmony 
Why, is, why am I not feeling patience? Obviously, there's something within me that I need to work on, that I need to. This is where people can help us. They reflect back to us what we need to adjust, what we need to overcome, what we need to conquer within ourselves. And usually, if we're unable to act on the paramedics, we're unable to light, act from that position of light. It's because we're not in the right position, that we're in the position of some kind of an attachment, some kind of desire. And so we are we have to root that desire out. And um, we have to get to the point where we want nothing from the external world, but that we want to shine everything from the inner into the outer from that position of compassion. But, and if we're not able to do that, it, it indicates something that we need, a preparation that we need to take. And then just- So it to, becomes our teacher, doesn't it? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah we've, we've uh, positioned ourselves in relation to the paramitas. And so then you can see the comparison or the, or the alignment or not, right? Mm-hmm. And what just following through, and you were mentioning how Wadia made the triangle of the first three, and then the last three, and then Viraga was in the middle, or yeah. Viraga was somewhere in relation to all that. And and so how might, um, I guess the the rest of them, or at least the higher three, because that's pretty tall stuff, right? How might those, how might the light of those be like beginner for, for beginners begin to kind of shine through in terms of thought, word, and deed? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. That prajna, the seventh one, is, is like the knowledge that we have acquired, the perception that we have. And whatever it is, to whatever degree, we have to shine that on all three planes of human life. We have to shine it in our thought, word, and deed. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the traveling of the path as well, to take what knowledge we have of theosophy, of the wisdom, and we have to uh, apply it to our daily life in order to gain more knowledge and more wisdom and more understanding of our sevenfold nature. It's also interesting that we might consider that the first three parameters and the, the last three with Viraga in the middle, is kind of like the wings of the bird. And that if we're sitting on the back of the bird, if we are indifferent to pleasure and pain, then we can witness, we can see the wings moving and we can see space and time. But if we're clinging mm -hmm. to one of the wings, then we're going to be flapping up and down mm -hmm. and we're not going to be able to perceive anything. It's only from that middle place, that indifference to pleasure and pain, that we can truly begin to perceive and maybe begin to understand prajna and meditation or dhyana you know that this is um we have to have that position as the voice of the silence where the wind cannot disturb the flame thank you very much does anyone have a uh, a last uh, closing thought or does laura it's um i think our time is up and thank you all very, very much. And thank you above all, Laura, for a magnificent presentation. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And a shout out to Jerry, because he made the slides look pretty. So, yeah, well, he's, he understands the importance of beauty. Of beauty in yes. Presentations. yes, he does. You know, yes. and he even says about, he even explained to me about the website and everything like that. He says, I want this website to be like walking into a beautiful lodge. Yes. You know. Yes. Well, you can see his talent there in the slides for sure. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Laura.